very much. Good morning. Um, let me say again that I'm happy to be here in this place of uh, cooperation with this topic. Uh, the game theory is about uh, competition and cooperation. So yesterday I talked about equilibria. Uh, today I'm going to talk about two topics, price of anarchy and mechanisms. And this picture shows uh, uh, both of them. Price of anarchy has to do with uh, uh, how much we, as a society, suffer because the selfishness of individuals, the rationality of individuals. So you see what happens. This is a Los Angeles highway. And you see a mechanism. If you notice, this lane here, it's a carpool lane. It's a mechanism that tries to alleviate the problem that is created by the selfishness of drivers. Uh, are the drivers selfish? So let's model it. So here is uh, what we're going to discuss, congestion games. What is a congestion game? It's a network. It's defined by a network. And uh, um, edges have latency functions. So here is a very simple network. It has a name. It's the PIGU network. This was studied 100 years ago, long before the game theory. And uh, the latency functions here have the following interpretation. The latency functions on this part is 1. Imagine that you want to go from point S to point T. You have two choices, either to go um, on surface, say, outside the city, it takes one hour to go there, no matter what is the traffic. So it's one hour independent of the traffic. X is the traffic. You have another choice to go through the city, and the latency is proportional to the traffic. So if, say, one here means, say, 10,000 cars. So if 10,000 cars go through this edge, then the latency is going to be one hour. If 20, thousand cars go through this edge, the latency is going to be two hours, and so on. Okay, so you are a driver, you are here at S, and you want to go to T, what are you going to do? It depends on the traffic. Suppose that you know that the traffic is 0.99. What are you going to do? Uh, you are going to follow the lower, lower uh, choice, right? Because your latency is going to be 0.99 instead of one. Everybody thinks like you. Everybody go follows the, the lower uh, path. And the latency of all of them, of each one, is 1, almost 1, 0.99. Right? So the expected latency, if you, if you do this, it's, uh, if, you, uh, if you go below, is 1 for everybody. Now imagine that you have a traffic, uh, uh, somebody controls traffic. And sends half of the traffic on the lower path and half of the traffic on the upper path. What is going to happen? What is going to be the expected latency that the society is going to, um, uh, to feel? So half of it will go up and will have latency of one. The other half will go down and will have latency proportional to the traffic, that is one half. So the expected latency is three quarters. So if we had somebody to control the traffic, we will lower the latency of the system. So selfishness chooses this road. A centrally controlled solution chooses both of them, and they differ in the expected latency, one and three quarters. We'll say that the price of anarchy in this case is four thirds. This is the ratio of one over three quarters. So you, we lose 33%. We have latency 33% higher than the optimal solution. So here is another network, similar network. It, it also has a name. It's called the Bryce network. This is famous, infamous, in fact. Um, again, drivers were going to go from, one to, from left to right, from one to four. 
the network is a little bit more complicated here. There are roads of traffic of latency one, roads of latency proportional to the traffic. This is a corridor that has no latency at all, virtually no latency. So again, traffic of rate one goes from one to four. They are going to follow the, the uh, if you are a driver there, you are going to do this. And you are not selfish. You are, you, it is your selfish. You are rational. You are, when you drive in the morning or in the afternoon, or you choose the best road for you, right? Well, selfishness is not something always negative. It's what we do. We optimize for ourselves. Right? You don't uh, take the long road. Sometimes we should. But uh, in this case, if you are here, you should go in this direction. Follow this path. Um, the other paths, for example, this here, uh, have uh, higher latency for you. So if you, do, so if you follow this path here, and the rate is 1, x is 1, the latency is going to be 1 plus 0 plus 1, 2. Notice uh, what will happen if we had somebody to uh, split the traffic to the top and lower paths. Uh, the, low, the upper part will have latency 1 plus half here, because x will be half. So it will be 3 quarters. Uh, three halves. Again, the ratio between the optimal solution, this is the optimal solution, and the selfish solution is four thirds. And this is an infamous network because it has the following property that if we destroy this road, if we close this road here, we don't allow drivers to go like that, but if we destroy this, then the traffic will improve. And this happens, in fact, in, uh, sometimes there are, also, there are cases, in, in, uh, I think in Stuttgart, they built a new road and the traffic became worse. Traffic for selfish drivers is not monotone. Latency is not monotone. That's why it's a paradox. It's called a paradox. It's not a paradox, it's just that uh, more roads doesn't mean that we can have better uh, and faster uh, the roads. Okay, so, so the general problem, what is a congestion gain? A congestion gain consists of a network and uh, players that follow, uh, run into the network. In this case, we have infinitely, practically, we, if we have 10,000 drivers or 100,000 drivers, we can take the limit of this. We can imagine that we have a flow of cars, infinitely many players. Each one follows uh, the optimal path for herself. And when uh, uh, they find a solution, this is called either word drop or in uh, game theory, Nash equilibrium. Everybody chooses the best path from uh, the source to destination. A, uh, if the latency functions are continuous, like for example here, there is always such an equilibrium. This is the analog of Nash's theorem for uh, this for congestion games. So uh, I mentioned the notion of price of anarchy. Let's define it properly. What is the price of anarchy? The price of anarchy is defined as uh, follows: it's the ratio of the cost of the worst Nash equilibrium over the socially optimal solution. So it's. Uh, uh, anarchy versus uh, central uh, planning, dictatorship or whatever. Which one do you prefer? It's, um, it's, uh, the ratio doesn't mean that this is better, uh, this is better than this, only that the latency here is better, but it may not be feasible to uh, implement this solution. It's not feasible to implement this in our roads, right? You cannot have somebody tell you exactly what road to follow. Okay. And um, there is the optimistic point of view. Why take the worst Nash equilibrium? We can take the best Nash equilibrium. And then we define the price of stability. For congestion games, for these congestion games, there is unique equilibrium. So it doesn't really matter. Both of them are the same. And there is, uh, so algorithmic game theory uh, I got a boost because of this theorem of Raf, Carden, and Tardos in 2001. They proved 
in such networks with linear latencies, the price of anarchy is at most four thirds. So the two examples that we have seen, the Pigu network and the Bryce network are the are worst cases. Nothing uh, worse can happen. An even uh, more optimistic result is the following, that Nash equilibrium is in some sense, this world drop or Nash equilibrium is in some sense optimal. If we take this uh, network and you double the traffic, the Nash solution is, uh, behaves like the optimal solution to the uh, double traffic. So uh, it's optimal in some sense. Okay. Now, yesterday we talked about finite games. This was an infi a game with infinite many players. There is a notion that is the analog of these games, uh, the finite congestion games. So in order to, uh, so finite congestion, congestion games, we have few players, two, three, uh, ten, and um, each one of them wants to establish a path. So. Um, this is a congestion game with few players who have few trains that affect each other very much. This is a congestion game that is essentially continuous. In Los Angeles, it's definitely very close to continuous <laughs> because, <laughs> okay. So this is also an analog of this is the game theory versus markets. In game theory, the, the uh, decisions of one affect everybody even himself changes the, uh, the valuation for everybody. In markets, you cannot affect the prices unless, of course, you are a very powerful individual. And that's one problem of today's economy. We have very powerful individuals that affect the market. So the market doesn't work as a market. It works essentially as a game between powerful individuals. So. Um, to see the difference, let's give you, give, let me give you another example, is the difference between jumping into a sea and jumping into your bathtub. You jump into the sea, the level of water will remain the same. You don't affect the level of water. If you jump into your bathtub, the level of water will go up. If you have a small bathtub. Okay, so what's a finite condition again? It's a, it's a graph, it's a network again. Players, here is an example. This is a game for two uh, players. Player one wants to start at one and follow a path to five. Player two wants to start at two and follow a path to five. Each one has two choices. For example, player one can go either in, uh, follow the direct path or the indirect path. Player two has also two choices, this or this path. This is a finite game. It has two Nash equilibria, two pure Nash equilibria. Both of them, that is, this and this, apparently is a Nash equilibrium. If everybody goes directly to the destination, they have no reason to switch. But also, this is a Nash equilibrium, going down and uh -huh, like that, and this guy goes like that and like that. The latency is not shown in these edges. The latency is proportional to the number of players using the edge. So if one player uses an edge, pays one. If two of them use the edge, they both pay two. Okay. And so this has two Nash equilibria, and one of them has price of anarchy two. Many games are like this. So here is the uh, prisoner's dilemma can be viewed as a congestion game. In prisoner's dilemma, every player has two choices, either to collaborate or to defect. The upper edge here. So you are here and you have to decide either to defect, go up, or collaborate, go down. So if you go up and you are alone, and if you defect, you pay zero. If both of you go up and both of you pay three. If, uh, if you go down and you are alone, you pay four, but both of, if both of you go down, you. Uh, you pay one, okay? So what is the Nash equilibrium here? In fact, it's a dominant equilibrium. Both will go up and will pay three. But they have no reason to switch because if somebody switches from three to lower path, he will pay four. 
That's, an, that's why it's a nice equilibrium. Here is another way to, uh, another game, how to formulate the L for all bar game. In this game, uh, let me remind you, it's the game that uh, if 60% of uh, a population goes to a bar, at most 60%, they are happy. If more than 60%, the bar becomes crowded and they don't like it. So here is, here is the choice of going to the bar. If you go to the bar, say your happiness is three, up to some point, and then the bar becomes crowded and your happiness drops to one. If you stay at home, your happiness is two. It's not affected by what the others are going to do. So, so congestion games capture a large class of interesting <coughs> games, very large class, and uh, there is a, a very nice theorem about them. The analog of uh, Nash's theorem for this is Rosenthal's uh, theorem that says every such game has a pure Nash equilibrium. Players don't have to randomize. There is always a pure Nash equilibrium. In fact, Rosenthal introduced this game uh, and proved this theorem. And uh, so for finite games, the price of anarchy is five halves. For continuous games, the price of anarchy is four thirds. So what can we say about that? Say so if you have markets if you cannot really affect the game very much, the price of anarchy is small, four-thirds. But if you have powerful individuals that affect the market, the price of anarchy may go up. So price of anarchy may sound like a negative concept, but it's not. Sometimes it gives us, says that democracy is uh, efficient. Of course, you can take any such theorem and you can interpret it in any way you want. So you can attach stories and uh, interpretations. It doesn't really say something. This theorem doesn't really say something concrete about political systems. But we can uh, get uh, some lessons out of them. OK. Um, so we have uh, games where the, there is a, um, the price of anarchy try, tries to capture how much we lose because we play selfishly. And um, selfish uh, behavior is not, uh, is, uh, sometimes we consider this as negative, but uh, notice that uh, in congestion games, um, selfishness essentially uh, is rationality. You take your, the best road for you. It's not rational to take a long road just because of society. The others will do something different. We don't do this, right? We don't, it's not expected from us to do it. Okay, so we have problems where we have uh, selfishness hurts the system, helps, uh, hurts society. Mechanism try to do exactly the opposite, to design a game so that uh, we achieve a goal improve the welfare of society. So uh, mechanisms, a typical example of mechanism is auctions. So here is a few uh, applications of mechanism design. Uh, internet routing. The internet consists of uh, thousands of entities that control parts of it, uh, ISPs. These are companies that want to optimize their own profit. So when you send a message from here to uh, Sao Paulo, it goes through many companies, uh, through uh, routers that are controlled by many companies. Each one of them wants to optimize their uh, uh, profit. So we need mechanisms so that they can collaborate and uh, achieve uh, a good solution. Um, what I want to discuss a little bit uh, sponsored search this is sponsored search. This is a, it's the way that uh, search engines get their money. And um, auctions is the typical uh, mechanism design. eBay, for example, has this, uh, is based on auctions. And uh, there are other issues like peer-to-peer uh, -peer networks where we have uh, 
for example, the problem of free riders and so on. There are many, many applications. And of course, there is the classical auction. So mechanisms is, uh, uh, are essentially algorithms with incentives. The incentives may be money or uh, something else, but it's essentially algorithms with incentives. And sometimes, so we have an algorithm, we try to introduce incentives so that we can optimize something. So for example, if you are a company, you try to optimize your revenue. In fact, for a company, you should optimize a profit, but internet companies, for example, try to optimize revenue. They don't care about profits when they start at least. Um, if you are uh, anybody else who wants to probably to optimize social welfare, happiness of society, that's what economists try to do. When I heard of this the first time, I was really surprised. I thought that economists try to optimize uh, profit. No, companies try to optimize profit. Economists try to optimize social, uh, uh, the social uh, objective, social welfare. And um, now that we have these complex networks with many players and algorithms that run on them, we try essentially sometimes to optimize other objectives. For example, to optimize fairness or to optimize uh, efficiency in uh, routing. This is not essentially the same as optimizing the total happiness. So let me uh, explain what is, an auction, what is a mechanism. Let's take an auction. The simplest auction is the following. You have uh, something to sell, say a painting, and uh, there are potential buyers. They are willing to pay, each one of them is willing to pay a higher price, a high price for this, some value that we don't really know. And that's the problem with mechanisms. There is uh, information that is known only by the participants, not by the algorithm. If, uh, if we knew in advance how much they are willing to pay, it will be a trivial problem to solve. Okay? So the objective that we are going to consider is the following. So just let me make it clear. Each, each potential buyer has a value you sub buy. This value is known to him and probably to the other participants, but not to the auctioneer. The objective, our objective, is to optimize welfare. Well, this is not a typical auction. We don't care how much money we get. We want the society to be as happy as possible. And how can we achieve this? By giving this item to the bidder that wants it most. The problem is that we don't know how much each one of us wants it. So not the objective is not money here, is optimizing happiness of the society. Okay. So these are the features of this kind of problem. We have incomplete information. Only bidders know their values. Money is used as an incentive, but it's not part of the objective. And uh, we're going to assume the following, that everybody, this is not the auction that uh, Sotheby's runs. Let's change the auction as follows. Everybody writes down in a piece of paper how much uh, they are willing to pay. They hand in the papers, and we decide what to do. It's not exactly different than this, than the Sotheby's model. But uh, just to simplify, let's consider this. The uh, direct revelation mechanisms. Everybody writes a piece, in a piece of paper uh, uh, what they know, hand it in, we compute who gets the item, how much they pay. Okay, so some bidders that have value use a buy, they may declare a value, some other value, let's call it utility. They may lie because they may have incentive to lie. The mechanism takes all these values, the tilde values, and computes the, um, um, who gets it and how much they pay. So let's consider the following mechanism that uh, um, you get these values and you give the item to the highest bid, which may be a lie, but you, that's what the algorithm is going to do. And uh, what is natural, how much she should pay the price that declared. So if somebody, so you collect the numbers and you see five, three, two, 
the maximum is 5. You give the item to uh, 5, to the player that declared 5, and C pays 5. This is very natural auction. The problem is that this is not truthful. You don't have any, you have incentive to lie. For example, if you knew that the numbers are 5, 3, and 2, you will never, you will not say 5, you will say 3.1. Right? You still get the item and you don't pay 5, you pay 3.1. So this is not incentive compatible. The interesting question is, are there incentive compatible mechanisms? Yes. This is a Nobel Prize uh, answer, essentially, for this simple idea. Vickery, in 1962, proposed the second highest bid. So the item is given to the highest bid, but the bidder pays the second highest value. So if the numbers are 5, 3, and 2, you get it, but you pay 3. So you don't have reason to go down to 3.1 to, to lie. Essentially, the mechanism for, takes care to lie for you. So this is counterintuitive. If you haven't seen this, it's uh, take um, a second to absorb it. So you pay the second, you take the item, but you don't pay your price, the price that you declare you uh, pay the second one. If you participate in eBay and this kind, if you have uh, um, accounts in online uh, um, uh, auctions, then you should be aware of this mechanism because this is what happens. Big reproof that this is uh, truthful. It is very, once you understand it, it's trivial to see that it is truthful. And uh, because it has two uh, characteristics, two properties. The payment of a player does not depend on his value, on his declared value. And the second property, which is not as obvious, is that the allocation is monotone. The higher price you declare, the, high, the most likely, more likely is to get it. So if you have these two properties, you, price does not depend on what you declare, and the allocation is monotone, then the, the, the auction is truthful. So here is a, um, the algorithmic version of this problem. Uh, Google, this is a page from uh, Google, a typical page from Google. So Google is famous uh, for two things. In fact, most of us know Google for one thing. Google came into the scene in 1998. Four years, if you seen the talk yesterday, I showed you a picture of a book from 1994. 1994, the uh, web was so small that it could fit in a book. In 1998, you couldn't search the web. It was so huge that you couldn't find anything. So you could go to Alta Vista, that uh, this was a search engine that showed everything. And uh, so you ask, say, for game theory, you get uh, 10,000 pages, in fact, probably a million pages. And uh, there was no way to sort them out. They didn't have a good way to sort them out. They tried some uh, techniques, they failed. Until Google came into the scene in 1990, late 90s, and uh, observed the graph of the web, not the content of the pages, because we didn't have the technology to look at the content of the pages. Look at only how the pages are connected between them, the hyperlinks, and uh, created its search engine. It was very successful. Um, the web continued to grow. But Google was a company that couldn't make any money. How do you get money out of this? You, you offer this service for free, right? You don't pay when you search in search engine. So a few years later, Google introduced the, um, its auctioning system. Advertisers pay when you search for something. They pay so that some links appear on the right side. Unfortunately, now on the top side. <laughs> in a few years, probably, you will not see anything other than advertisements. And um, Google was not the first one to introduce um, uh, auctions, uh, to introduce uh, um, advertisements in its uh, page. This was started in 1998. 
But Google had a very, came up with, uh, somebody in Google knew about the second price auction. So Google decided to do the following. These advertisements, these uh, ads here, are going to be selected by an auction. Every time you search for something, an auction runs that decides who wins these positions, and they pay something to Google. So how, so how much do they pay? The top slot, which is the best, is considered the best, pays the price of the second slot. So that we have here two advertisers. Say this advertiser said that uh, I want this for $40. This advertiser said that I want it for $30. So you put the 40 here, but uh, uh, it pays 30, not 40, the second price. And I say it pays, not he or she pays, because probably this is done by software. This, uh, companies, advertisers probably have agents, software agents that try to uh, uh, play these games. The second one play, pays the third price. The third pays the fourth, and so on. So this is Google's, uh, and Google makes uh, a few, uh, about 50 billion per year from these auctions. That's the only income that Google has, essentially. Nothing else, essentially. And um, uh, Yahoo, that was a com uh, company that was competing with Google at some time, didn't have this second prize. Had a first prize auction. And I don't know. I don't believe that this is the reason for failing, but uh, <laughs> it makes you think about it. So. A little bit of game theory, a little bit of mechanism design, this second price auction is good to know. It may make you 50 billion per year, but you have to learn your lesson well, or to, lesson, to learn it very, very well, because this auction is not truthful. Well, how come? This is a second price auction. Not really, because we don't have an item here. We have slots. We have one, two, three, four slots, say, here. Okay. It's not the same as saying that this pays the second, this pays the third, and so on. It may be the actual truthful mechanism it will be that this will pay the fourth, the, the, the fifth price in order to be truthful. So Google's auction is not truthful. So advertisers have a reason. They play a game between them. They try to out, uh, they don't have to be, they know that they can gain, gain advantage by lying. So they play a game between them. How much I'm going to declare because uh, the other is going to declare and this and so on. They have to start, start this, they have this strategic uh, thinking. It becomes very complicated. What do we know about this? It's a very complicated situation. It becomes much more complicated because Google is such a, uh, doesn't give us any information at all. But uh, we can analyze some games, some reasonable games that try to capture the situation, and the price of anarchy is 1.6. Um, so this, all these are a mechanism with money. Money is the object, essentially, for some of, uh, for the auctioneer here, right? Although Google, uh, for this auctioneer, the auctioneer here is Google. Google says that, um, why doesn't Google uh, switch to a truthful mechanism? Because uh, they say that it's good for the society. <laughs> do we believe them? I don't know. But they try to do good, as they say. Do we believe them? Okay, now, there is another aspect to mechanism, mechanism without money. So when uh, we are scientists, right? So we prefer, uh, we don't like money. So, say. <laughs> okay, so here's a mechanism without money. Definitely here is a mechanism, is a situation where we don't want money. That's the serious political problem of today, one of the serious political problems of today. In fact, of every age, but especially today. Uh, voting, we want to vote. We don't want to pay the candidates to pay us to be 
uh, to vote for them. So what's the problem here? We have candidates, politicians, voters, and they have to select a candidate. They have to select, say, a president. Of course, this is a huge gain in uh, our society, but let's just keep it uh, short here. So voter one, in this case, we have all the preference for voter one. She prefers candidate one. Her second choice is two. Her third choice is three. This voter here has the choice. This is the first choice. This is the second choice. This is the third choice, and so on. So suppose that we have the voters voting there. They declare their votes. They declare essentially, suppose we have this table. Who should become president? It's very hard to, to, to say, right? And there are many proposals how to interpret it. Because we have individual preferences and we have to aggregate them. They don't agree. We have to aggregate. That's what voting does, right? Take preferences and aggregate them. Okay? And so there are uh, many such uh, situations, M many such schemes. For example, border scheme. Border scheme, essentially, it's one way is the following. You add these numbers here. This is 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 2, uh, 8, and so on. And you choose the minimum one in this case. Right? Because... Uh, so if this were, all of these were one, this would be a perfect uh, solution. But unfortunately, it's not. So this is border solution. In fact, you can put a weight on them. It doesn't have just to sum them up, but sum a weighted sum of them. Take a weighted sum of them. There are many other uh, proposals. Go to the Wikipedia page to see how many of them, some of them, in fact. And why? Because none of them is good for every situation. In fact, all of them can be manipulated. For example, if you are voter three and you know what the others are going to do, you don't choose your favorite candidate, but you'd say something different in order for your favorite candidate to become president. For all such schemes, it is, uh, this is, uh, uh, this happens. It's very surprising. And there is a theorem, a famous theorem in the, from the mid-70s, the gibbard satterwhite theorem, that says there is no aggregation that is truthful. Voters that know everything have, in some situations, reasons to switch, to say something different, to lie. Unless uh, the uh, selection is completely idiotic, like uh, dictatorial, which means we select vote, voter three from the beginning and we do what he says. Other than this, every other scheme is non-truthful. That's a shock for democracy. There is a famous theorem by Arrow from the 50s, they, which says essentially the same. Uh, this is about selecting a president. Uh, Arrow's theorem is about selecting, um, say, more. Not only you want to find the best one, but also to find the second one, the third one, and so on. OK. Now, let's see. These are preferences here that uh, these numbers just indicate their order, right? We can generalize this problem which becomes much more interesting, when we have um, the bidders not, not only uh, order their uh, choices, but also have the a value for them. So bidder four, for example, prefers outcome one with value four, outcome two with value eight, and so on. In other words, he is willing to pay 4,000 for the first outcome for uh, 8,000 for the second outcome, and so on. The outcome may not be a president, may not be a vote now, it may be general, because this generalizes the situation to many, many other uh, problems. And what's the, the obstacle? The obstacle is always the same in these cases, in the uh, mechanism. The bidders may lie, may not declare their true values, they, because they can manipulate the algorithm that decides 
Okay. And uh, so this is the situation. And imagine the following, that we have this uh, society. And we want to select the outcome that maximizes happiness in society. In other words, we want to select the outcome that has the maximum sum, the column that has the maximum sum. For example, if, in this case, outcome three is uh, more desirable by the society. It's not the best one for uh, bidder three. Bidder three prefers outcome two. But if we aggregate, if we sum up the happiness of all of them, if these numbers represent happiness, then if we want to maximize happiness of society, this will be uh, the solution. If we want to, to uh, maximize fairness, there will be another solution probably, right? So let's fix our objective. We want to maximize happiness of society. Select the column that maximizes these values. The problem is that if we knew these numbers, it will be trivial. We don't know them. They are hidden. They are private values. The bidders, the participants, may, have, may lie and declare something else. For example, uh, bidder three may have a reason to lie if by lying, outcome two will be selected. For example, suppose that we take these numbers, we select the maximum, take the maximum, and this is the, uh, the, what we do. So we take this number and say, OK, this is maximum. So let's select outcome three. Notice that bidder two now has a reason to lie, can uh, manipulate this choice. We will declare 26 here. And then this will be the maximum. It's better for him. It appears to be better for society, but it's not. OK? So is there a way to solve this problem? Yes, with money. If we pay, if the bidders pay, OK? And so here is, uh, here is the uh, famous VCG mechanism. VCG stands for Vickery, Clark, Groves. Vickery was the, the guy that had this uh, second price idea. This is a generalization of second price idea, and uh, it is the following. We want to find the, maximum, the column with a maximum sum. We ask them to give us the values. They may lie. We select the column with, suppose that they declare these values. Then we select the column with the maximum uh, outcome, but we ask them to pay in order to enforce, in some sense, the truthfulness. So how much are they going to pay? If they're going to pay their, their value, what they declare, this is not a truthful mechanism. This is like first price auction. It is not truthful. VCG has a, a smart idea. It says, OK, everybody pays the value that declares. But she gets a discount equal to the extra happiness that we bring to society by being there. This sounds complicated. Let me explain it. So this is apparently the best solution, which has uh, uh, total happiness 10 plus 5 plus 4 plus 10. We don't ask the first bidder to pay 10. But he's going to pay something different. So here is what is going to happen. We'll compute the total, the total happiness, the social welfare, as we call it, is 10 plus 5 plus 4. It's this sum here, 29. Take bidder out, out of the game, out of the situation. What will be the happiness of society? It will not be 19. The maximum happens here, 8 plus 6 plus 8, 22. So if you take this bidder out, the happiness drops from 29 to 22, right? So we give this bidder a discount of 7, the difference. So he doesn't pay 10, but only 3. 10, what he declared, minus the happiness that adds to the society, 7. So it's like second price. In fact, it is 
a generalization of second price. If we, if, you, if we view the problem of selling one item, it's the following. Imagine that we have three bidders and three outcomes. This is uh, selling an item. Outcome one is that bidder one gets the item. Outcome two is that bidder two gets the item. Outcome three is that bidder three gets the item. So notice that the values for the first bidder are 9, 0, 0. He gets a satisfaction of 9 and nothing if he doesn't get the item and so on. So if you run VCG on this, you get the second price option. I'm going to skip this example. So VCG is a very nice mechanism. It is always truthful. It maximizes happiness of society. And the question is, are there other mechanisms? Unfortunately not. Robert's theorem from 1997 says, essentially VCG is the unique mechanism truthful mechanism. Okay, there are va slight variants of it they, that they don't really affect the mechanism. This is the only truthful mechanism for general domains. But if you restrict the problem, then it becomes, it's not clear. And this is a major open problem. For example, if you have an auction with uh, Multiple items, we don't know what are the true, the truthful mechanisms. It's a major open problem. The most important probably open problem in mechanisms. And um, what if we don't want to maximize, so therefore, if we don't want to maximize welfare, the total happiness, but we want to maximize something else, for example, fairness, or efficiency. Here is an example. You, have, you want to do something, you have workers. Each one of them has their own skills. They can do this well, the other less well, and so on. You want to assign them tasks to do, to uh, perform something, to do something. And so you don't care about the happiness of the workers, the total happiness. You care about doing the project efficiently. Robert's theorem says that there are no good mechanisms in general for this, but for this particular problem, there may be mechanisms. Unfortunately, we can prove something uh, negative. For example, no mechanism can find a solution that is optimal. Why? Because we don't know the skills of the workers. They are not going to tell us if they, if, if they are going to get an advantage out of it. They are going to lie about their skills. So if they lie about their skills, we have to have a, 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 a clever algorithm. But when we do this, we lose something. We lose at least 2.6, a fraction of 2.6, probably more. The conjecture is that we lose much more, but we cannot prove it. Okay, before I close, let me uh, say something about rationality. We talked about rationality. We introduced money. Money is not the only objective. Sometimes there are other objectives. Are we, our species is homo sapiens, meaning wise man. Right? Are we? We notice that, for example, in prisoner's dilemma, we don't feel well when we uh, see the solution what game theorists come and tell us. There are other games that are equally disturbing. For example, I'm not going to describe them, um, just put them here for uh, your uh, reference, uh, the ultimatum game or the traveler's dilemma, in which we don't play Nash equilibrium. So we said this in such situations, we, uh, we, in these games, we don't play Nash equilibrium. We play something different. And this is good, in fact, because we get something more out of it. How come? So we are homo sapiens in some cases, not in all cases. And uh, the question is, uh, uh, are we rational? It's a, 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 um, in economics, 
there is a large uh, research direction today on finding out how we really think, how we uh, evaluate situations. And of course, we are not rational. We, are, we know that. Uh, we know that we are not completely selfish. And, uh, but uh, how much and at what level? Are we selfish at the level of genes? That is, uh, our genes play a game between them. We, which one is going to survive? Okay, they don't uh, write down on a closed piece of paper what they are going to do, but essentially they play a game. Uh, also, as individuals, we play games between us. As, uh, also, we take sometimes the welfare of families or our communities, nations, even species play games against each other. Evolutionary game theory is a very interesting um, direction. Just to, to close this, uh, there is another game theoretic issue, tragedy of commons. Over exploitations, we take and uh, uh, fish, we fish a lot, we destroy our environment. It's good for us individuals. If I go out and fish and get, bring back a, a, a load, it's, it is good for me, right? at least at this moment. And, uh, or if we exploit the land. This is the uh, old problem, the strategy of commons. Because we don't pay from what we get. But in the long run, if everybody gets everything, there, is not, there will be nothing there. There will be no feces, nothing to, on the land. This is a, a game that we have, have to learn how to play. So we have to be less greedy. We have to be good. It's good for us. Thank you. Um, so, so far you t always talked about one-time interaction, and, but in real situations, this is not only being selfish, but also, for instance, be there being trust and similar right. things in economic environments. So if you, for instance, repeat the prisoner dilemma 100 times with the same person, maybe the optimal solution changes. Can you comment on these things? Yes. Um, first of all, uh, let's just uh, settle the prisoner's dilemma, which is easy. Suppose that you play it for 100 times, and nothing is going to change. What are you going to do on the 100th time? There is no future. It's the last round. You're going to be selfish. In the 99th round, you know that your opponent is going to be selfish on the uh, last round. You have no reason not to be selfish. On the 98th round, you don't have a reason to be selfish, and so on. By backwards seduction, you have to. Be, Nas equilibrium is to defect. It's the unique Nas equilibrium. No matter what you do, there are thousands of solutions out there. It's the narrative that is wrong. It's not the game that is wrong. Of course, you can. Uh, uh, for example, there are approximate Nas equilibria that are uh, which will cooperate, but uh, there. Uh, if you take. Uh, a Nas equilibrium, this is the unique Nas equilibrium. Now, um, that was uh, uh, the easy part because we don't, uh, we have the long term, uh, at least if we look at us, we have the long term uh, goals. We don't know what are our goals, in fact. There is incomplete information. So there is space for uh, working together. That's why, well, altruists, we have some kind of altruism. Uh, friendship is not something that we only get out of it, right? In fact, it's, uh, uh, when we look at this, this is a simplistic point of view because the um, objective here is money, greed, and so on. Uh, if, you put, uh, if you look at the general games that we play, sometimes we don't, uh, for example, most of us here, don't care so much about money, but about, say, uh, something else, uh, reputation or self-satisfaction, 
by just uh, proving a theorem like that. I'll give you $100,000 or I'll give you the opportunity to write a good uh, paper, very good paper. Are you, which one are you going to choose? If you look only at money, you're going to choose money. But we don't, our, our objectives are much more complicated. So I have a similar sort of question, in fact. Um, I have a situation which looks very much like what you've been discussing. I deal with um, uh, getting data hosted at CMS sites, around 70 odd sites around the world. Uh, we move a petabyte of data a week around these sites. They're trying to host a data for um, analysis and for further processing. So in a sense, they're competing to host popular data. And this is something which looks like it can easily be modeled as an auction. So the situation I have, though, is that every half hour, we reevaluate the situation. So we essentially rerun the auction. And the site's utility functions may change. If somebody didn't get data in one auction, they may want it in the next. And this, I imagine, is a bit like real-life auctions. If you don't get that Van Gogh, you might want to buy the Rembrandt next time around or something like that. Right. So these are essentially auctions where the utility function is changing. These repeated auctions, the utility function is changing between one auction and the next. Um, you haven't talked about repeated auctions. Yet. Right. Uh, yeah, I, I, I kept it as simple as possible. Yeah. And th this was one. Uh, the other is that, for example, in Google auctions, these are repeated auctions. Mm -hmm. The, the, we don't understand them very well. Even the simple auctions uh, like Google, we don't understand. Um, especially if you put budgets on them, uh, which mixes up money and objectives, or whatever, the two, mixes, mixes ob uh, two objectives, and we don't really understand them. We don't have these cute, nice theorems for this kind of auctions. And, um, but utility doesn't really change it changes, but not as dramatically as it appears. It's just that when you take a, a picture of uh, the utility, for example, if you look only at uh, uh, Rembrandt, you don't look at the utility of uh, having a painting, right? You look at the utility of having this particular painting. So you just uh, reduce the, um, the information. So this, this becomes a problem essentially of incomplete information. Again, a situation where we don't really understand. We don't understand the problems with complete information, these simple problems. And, um, uh, yes. Uh, what does the price of anarchy mean as a value? How do you interpret the value? Price of anarchy is the ratio of the solution that you get at an ass equilibrium over the solution that you get when uh, a solution is computed uh, optimally. Okay. But is there is um, an interpretation that says that a, num a value is better than other? How do you... Right. If the price of anarchy is one, yeah. this means that uh, the uh, selfishness uh, is optimal. Okay. The value price of anarchy is very high. It means that selfishness hurts the situation, the society very much. Okay. So when it's above one, it's worse for all? One is good for everybody, okay. even for society and for everybody. Yeah. Large means bad for society. Bad for society. It may be good for some of them. Okay. And sometimes it's bad for everybody. The example that I, um, I gave in Bryce's paradox, by being selfish, everybody is hurt. Everybody loses 33%. But we cannot help, uh, help it because we cannot agree on a solution in uh, such a distributed system. So I, I was a little confused by the difference in the price of anarchy for the two cases, the discrete and the continuous. Because when you consider like a city that's growing, eventually it, it becomes from the discrete case more similar to the continuous case. And the price of anarchy changes so dramatically. How, how can this be? I mean, mathematically, it's always discrete, right? But it's a, it's a difference between um, um, uh, discrete and continuous. It's not between 100 and 101. Because you have a game for 100, a price of anarchy for 100 players, it's fourth, it is five halves. For 101 players, it is five halves. When you go to continuum, it drops to four thirds. Because 
you see, 100 players, you can take 100 players and make 99, 98 of them unimportant. So it becomes essentially a game of two. You reduce it to a game of two. But when you have infinitely many players, by assumption, the assumption is that they cannot affect the system. It's a matter of mathematical modeling rather than... Uh, uh, so are you saying that even in Los Angeles, the price of anarchy is high for the traffic? Definitely, it's very close to four thirds. I, I, nobody knows exactly because we, don't, we cannot model it, but you can, uh, we cannot model it precisely. But there is a price of anarchy that is probably close to four thirds, probably more because the latency functions are not linear in our roads. This four thirds is for linear functions. But then even in the example that you gave with the markets, why is there a difference when there are few big players in the market and when there are many small players? We don't know the price of anarchy in, in the markets, right? But you can imagine that uh, having great players out there, that they affect the game so much, they affect even, they become selfish, greedy, and they affect the game so much that even it hurts themselves. So uh, there was a, for example, uh, there was a story recently, uh, there was a very nice uh, article in New York Times, that the traders from Chicago built, uh, essentially they built a very fast line to New York just to be able to uh, gain three milliseconds of time of uh, sending uh, uh, an, an instruction, trading instruction, which is uh, amazing if you think about it. It shows that this game, uh, this is a game that they play, at, uh, this is, that these are major players, um, is completely different than the game that we play, say, when you invest your uh, uh, little money. I don't know if you have, <laughs> you may be a billionaire. It's completely different than uh, what Buffett, for example, uh, does. So we don't know the price of anarchy for how much this is affected. It may be affected a lot. That's what the theorem says. It doesn't say that the price of anarchy is higher, it may be lower. But it has the potential to be higher. Uh, this, uh, let me clarify, this five halves and four thirds is the worst case. Take the worst game, the worst situation. Of course, this, is, uh, this tells us nothing about particular games and particular situations. Yeah, so it's, it's not fully clear to me uh, how then you explain altruism. I mean, how, does it, how does altruism emerge in uh, human beings or in societies in general? I can only speculate about that, but it's good for, uh, for the species, right? But, I mean, the, the, the theory, the game theory should, should model that, should be capable of modeling that. Especially oh, yes, they, they try to model it, but uh, I, I don't think that we really understand. Uh, this, is, this is a very complicated game, a repeated game. It has also the time parameter. For exactly. example, we for evolve. Reason, right? You said that for the prisoner dilemma, even in the iterative... Uh, case, the, uh, the, the best solution is still the, the fitting. Right. Uh, actually, I do remember reading something, for instance, Axel There are many, many papers. Like, yeah. Dyson, for example, the 90-year-old uh, physicist, had a paper on that, resolving this paradox. But there is no paradox, in my opinion. So, indeed, I mean, some solutions are not exactly selfish, right? I mean, some solutions, I mean, Co cooperation emerges, right? Isn't, is that true? Of course, we know that, right? This I mean, is a place of cooperation, and of, of course. But uh, the question is how to model it precisely. And uh, this, we don't play this game, this two by two game. We play a much larger game, and then uh, we just evaluate this. This is uh, this is not the, the right. This is not the right question when you ask about human cooperation. It's a much complicated game. It's not about this particular one. It's the wrong na narrative for this game, I think. Not the game itself. Yeah. You mentioned about the uh, auction that uh, the first bidder uh, pays the price uh, of the second bid. I don't understand. There are like two questions there. Why uh, would someone, would a company, the seller, would use this type of auction because he would have like less profit? And the second one, let's say I would like to advertise something in Google, and uh, the uh, like I know what is the second bid. 
I can, I, I can bid like an outrageous price in order to guarantee my position, my advertisement, <coughs> and actually pay the uh, price yeah. of the second yeah. bid, right? Uh, there is nothing wrong about that. If you are willing to pay the second price, you don't have, it means that you value this position more than the value of the second price, right? Than this. So if you are willing to pay, say, $5, you value your, the position more than $5. So yeah. either if you declare 5.1 or 5, 5 billion, you'll get this position. So why declare 5, uh, 5 billion? I have no reason. Because you don't know what is... Okay. Yeah. This auction is truthful. Everybody that sees the first line does not believe that this is a truthful auction. You think about it, you'll find out that it's truthful. Have no reason to declare something higher, have no reason to declare something lower. If you know the other values... Yeah, I think... And uh, the fact that why would like uh, Google, for example, use this uh, auction, like if they can have like more profit, why don't they simply accept the highest uh, bid? And because the advertisers will lie and declare something less. Okay. Yeah. In fact, they lie today because their auction is not truthful. The guy that designed this auction. That's a speculation. I don't know how they, it, they, it came. Uh, knew about the second price, but uh, it, this guy didn't know that uh, if you have more slots, this will not become truthful. Or she was a genius and designed it because this gives more profit to, to Google according to some models. It appears truthful. Nobody has a reason to learn it. To lie, unless they start really thinking very carefully. It appears truthful, so uh, it works like truthful and gives more profit to Google. So it's either it's a move of genius or a half uh, knowledge. Yeah. yeah. Uh, then why all the other auctions like eBay or Sotheby's are still the other way? Sorry, I don't I mean, know about eBay. I, I hear that it's a second, second price, it's not okay. first price. But Sotheby's should be the first one, right? Sotheby's should be the first one, right? The, the normal auction like everyone is seeing. So let's take Sotheby's auction. Yeah. This is second price. Ah, really? It's fact it is. Let, let's think about it. It's not. You pay what you declare, but let's think about it. The price, so it starts to have this uh, a painting to, uh, to sell. So the price goes up. You say 100, I say 101. I'm willing to pay uh, 1 million. Okay? 100, 101, 102, 110. You drop out. I don't pay the million. I pay 110. In fact, in all these films that the prices go up, and you say 5, 7, 9, 30. This is a silly move, right? You should not declare. You should say 8, 9. Then go up slowly until you, of course, we are not rational. Psychology plays a role. So by saying 30, you, it may be a good strategy against humans, right? But uh, not against software agents, proper software agents. <laughs> yes. So say Google switched to an actual truthful uh, auction tomorrow. Would the profits go up, down, or it's not clear? Nobody knows. <laughs> it's so complicated. Probably they know. Uh, I doubt that they know completely because they don't know what the advertisers uh, do exactly. So they have huge amounts of uh, data. They can try to infer what the advertisers are willing to pay. And probably they run models. But now there is a very serious reason for not switching because once you have such a stable, if you have a, a, a goose a, uh, with golden eggs, you don't want to switch to a cow, right? They don't uh, make eggs, that's a problem. Yeah. Classical economics, uh, Adam Smith's invisible hand, uh, then assumes that the price of anarchy is one. That is right. right. So do you have an idea of what the price of anarchy is really uh, in, uh, in today's economic uh, systems? But it's, I it's have not no higher, idea. It's not higher than four thirds, but where is it between one no, and four No, no, it may be higher because this four thirds is under certain assumptions for the latencies and so on. It may be much higher. In some game, for example, in Prisoner's Dilemma, mm -hmm. this is why we don't like it, the price of anarchy is much higher. 
is, for example, in this prisoner dilemma, it's three, because you pay three, more, three years instead of one. Uh, so in today's economy, what is the price of anarchy? How can we even start uh, uh, understanding this question? The people that have the information uh, to start computing it, uh, they don't want uh, probably to reveal the answer. Um, one of the big assumptions in a lot of economics is that a market is in equilibrium. But what you said last time, that essentially it's so hard to find the Nash equilibrium, neither with a laptop or with, with, the, with the market itself, suggests that often markets might not be in equilibrium, actually. So they are not in equilibrium, we know that, right? That's why we are, uh, if you just check now, in, uh, in, uh, um, say, in uh, market, stock market, the prices keep changing, right? If it was in equilibrium, it would be stable. There is no information that came in. Uh, that the, there are information that comes in, but also, uh, even if no information comes in, still uh, the market is not stable because it's not, it's not in equilibrium, we know that. The question is whether it's close to an equilibrium and what kind of equilibrium. What kind, in, uh, in repeated games, just to go back to uh, your question and the other question, in repeated games we don't understand equilibria because it's not, uh, we understand, try to understand static equilibria, but we we'll have dynamic situations. What is the solution? Uh, we don't have a principal answer like the Nash equilibrium. So, if there is nothing more, thanks very much to everyone who came again and stayed, and thanks very much to the lecturer again. Thank you very much.